With tensions escalating in the war between Israel and Hamas, surely no one will be cynical enough to exploit this situation in order to make a profit. You wouldn't expect, for example, members of US Congress to be investing in military-related stocks, would you? Well, you should expect that. Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining us on our voyage to truth and freedom at a time where it is necessary more than ever to look at the world through different eyes and importantly, support independent media where you can so we can have complex conversations about complex matters and review and analyze potential solutions together. Certainly no one can claim to have answers with something as complicated as this, but it's vital that you don't only believe what you read or see in legacy media with something so complex as this. So if you can support us, support us. Remember, we're on Rumble every day. Download the app, you get notifications and we can continue to stay in contact with you and learn from you. And I pray to God, develop solutions together that are beneficial for us individually, collectively, globally. If such a thing were ever possible, please make it revealed now. Obviously, with something as sensitive as this, you wouldn't imagine that there will be anyone anywhere in the world looking to exploit such a sensitive and awful situation from which nobody really clearly benefits, if you ask me, to be looking for opportunities to profit. And yet that is precisely what's happening. Military experts are predicting record profits for weapons manufacturers, as always happens in war. And that's a brutal reality, I suppose. But you certainly wouldn't expect, would you, members of the United States Congress to be investing in defense related stocks? Wouldn't that undermine everything they've been telling you about the authenticity of their feelings, however they regard this conflict or claim to regard this conflict? All of the grandstanding and moralizing and the sympathetic I stand with or we must be pro. How does that look in light of the fact that members of Congress have been investing in military related stocks? Let's have a look at Joe Biden, as you might imagine, pledging support and claiming that this is a simple moral issue. My administration's support for Israel's security is rock solid and unwavering. Let me say this as clearly as I can. Not a high bar. This is not a moment for any party hostile to Israel to exploit these attacks to seek advantage. Or perhaps you could argue anyone to exploit these attacks from any angle. Surely, with all of the complexities that must be considered in this long historic matter, you wouldn't expect it to be reduced to an exercise in profiteering, particularly not by people that are making decisions with regard to the military aspect of this encounter, would you? Well, you probably would if you have access to independent media because you will be well informed about the machinations of government and in spite of its rhetoric, what its priorities always remain. Will you ever believe again Again, that they are morally guided. Let's get into this. As tensions escalate between Israel and the Hamas group, it has been revealed US congressional leaders have been making some strategic investment moves into military related stocks. That's pretty astonishing, isn't it? To consider that when most of us are thinking, where do you find a unifying truth in this complex and horrific matter that there are people in Congress paid for by you, elected to serve you, that are right now going, this might be a good time to invest in Lockheed Martin. I think we're going to be selling a lot of missiles. For starters, defense company General Dynamics has witnessed a surge in purchases. This isn't entirely unexpected. Defense stocks often become attractive during times of geopolitical tension. And whilst that might be plain common sense, it's also an indicator that there are systemic problems that might need to be addressed. If foreign policy crises and military crises are able to be exploited, not just by the weapons industry, which is bad enough, but also by politicians and Congress people, that might be something that needs to be examined. If health crises are beneficial to pharmaceutical companies, if energy crises are beneficial to energy companies, all the while punitive to ordinary people all around the world, isn't that an opportunity for systemic analysis, revolution, reformation and change? Tell me which one in the chat and the comments. However, what's even more intriguing is the sectoral split between Republicans and Democrats. A substantial number of Republicans have shown a keen interest in the energy sector. Heavyweights like ExxonMobil, Devon Energy and Chevron are clearly the favourites. On the other side of the aisle, Democrats seem to be playing the long game, focusing on the cybersecurity sector with acquisitions in firms like Fortinet, according to insights by At Unusual Wales on X. 
There are so many complex issues, it's churlish and rude, I think, to reduce this long, historical, painful, agonizing conflict into platitudes or tribalism. There are enough people that will do that. Perhaps we could focus together on the things that we can uniformly agree are wrong. And I would say people in Congress buying stocks exploitatively is wrong and could be banned. But who would ever vote for such a thing? Who would ever propose such a legislation? Usually what happens at times like this is because there's a unified public opinion, they push through a bill to invest more in defence and then maybe tack on an idea like, and we'll also invest in more weapons for Ukraine as well. That's also happening. Major defence stocks added around $20 billion in market cap yesterday following the events. What's interesting about this is this is relatively mainstream media just reporting on this matter plainly, observably. Makes you wonder, wow, if we know all of this, why are we not able to make different decisions together? Over the last three days, so Northrop Grumman and Lockheed, among those still trending higher, these types of moves are not uncommon during times of war. Now, a similar surge happened when Russia invaded Ukraine. And you're looking at some of the movement that we're seeing today in Lockheed Martin up just about 1% as well as Boeing, RTX and Northrop also once again moving to the upside. Now, these gains coming on, like we just said, a strong day for the stocks. Yesterday, we saw a big jump. Northrop coming off its biggest daily gain since we've seen uh, that we've seen since 2020. The truth is, if it's someone's job, to make those kind of investments, I imagine they would make those kind of investments. But similarly true is if it's your job to run America, to represent the people of America, and you are also making those kind of investments, I would say that's an indication that your moral character is perhaps not appropriate for government. But the thought process is just in terms of the amount of spending, what's going to be allocated towards some of these defense companies given the conflict and the risk that this uh, war could widen over in the Middle East. That's why we're seeing the reaction play out in shares today. Once yeah, and, and from a technical perspective, too, it'd be interesting to look at this for anyone who's trying to figure out if some of the spikes that take place after there are international conflicts or, or events of international conflict. How can you have people involved in making decisions about American military expenditure similarly investing in companies that will benefit from American military expenditure? That is one of the areas of corruption that I think we can all agree on or be addressed. It's the kind of bias that will lead to escalation in any conflict, not even specifically this one, because it remains profitable. This has to be extracted. This problem has to be closed down. Firstly and foremostly, it should be illegal to trade in stocks and shares in industries that you regulate or in any matter in which you possibly have influence. That's just common sense, isn't it? Then perhaps it will be easier to have conversations around solutions and peace. Complex though those conversations remain in the geopolitical climate that we are currently in, whether that's the Russia-Ukraine conflict or this current escalating situation in the Middle East. How can we have a good faith, open conversation at the level of media or the level of politics when plainly a significant factor is the opportunity to exploit these situations for weaponry profit and energy profits? Wouldn't it be good to at least remove that so there was one less complex component that exacerbated this already dreadful situation? Where some of the defensive names continue to cyclically in this instance here get some type of attention from investors since, and I kind of point back to early 2022, when we were thinking about the initiation of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and what took place there. Shares jumped by about 25% in that instance. It's held on since then to the majority of that move since the beginning of 2022. Remember, these companies that see these benefits from these conflicts spend money on lobbying. They spend billions collectively on lobbying. Lobbying simply means jostling, cajoling, biasing, influencing, prejudicing the direction of political expenditure. Taxpayer dollars will be flowing in this direction. Legislation, regulation, policy that prevents the continuation of that profit will be averred, ignored, reduced, diluted. You don't have to have strong views, and many people understandably do on this complex, horrific conflict to recognise that this is a problem. This is a systemic problem. And remember, systemic problems are where we have to focus our attention if we actually want to change the world. World. What institutionally is wrong with the media? What institutionally is wrong with the government? What I mean by institutionally is you could change the individuals within it. You could even change the parties within it and the problem wouldn't change because the true power and the true interests are ulterior to the level that can be organised by 
by public opinion or democracy or discourse or debate. That's why you need independent media like this, because complex and difficult though it is, we must remain in communication with one another. Those of us that are not directly affected by the horrific events that are taking place have a different type of duty, a duty of respect, a duty of care, a duty, I would say, of deep spiritual prayer and deep hope, but to remain, importantly, awakened. Awakened to the possibility that there surely must be a better way than this, and that one of the ways that we might modulate in the favour of peace might be to amend these systems. Let me know if you agree in the chat. Let me know if you agree in the comments. And if you can, press the red button, become an awakened wonder, support our movement. It's plain that this kind of conversation is a problem for the powerful. They want people angry, confused, and divided. And you have to look at the world now and say that fear and terror and dread and pain and confusion is increasing. If we don't make any measures to amend that as individuals, as a community, you can see where the trend is going to take us. And then additionally here, you think about uh, the move higher that we've seen just over the past couple of days here. We can't bring you complex, independent reporting without our sponsors and partners. Sat. 123.com make this thing. Let me tell you why this phone that looks a bit like it's from the recent past is actually the phone of the future. Are you suspicious of technology? Are you addicted to that little thing? Do you think it's spying on you? Do you think it's tricking you? Can you rely on it? Cell phones go down for hundreds of reasons, but satellite phones like this guy will always work because you're carrying your own personal cell tower with you everywhere you go. Does that mean it's more hard to trace you? Prepare for the unexpected. Anyone with a satellite phone in the affected areas of Hawaii, the Nevada desert, like a burning man, would have a way to communicate with friends and family and emergency services. And guess what? No tracking. No one can listen in on your calls. You can organize revolutions. The most secure way to communicate is from a satellite phone to another satellite phone. Get one for your friends. Do walkie talkies like kids, like in the film Big, when they talk across the alley till Tom Hanks became a big person because of that machine. Yeah, it got confusing already, that bloody film. I still don't know what the message is. The US military uses sat phones for secured communication. And those guys know how to keep their business quiet. Please visit sat123.com or call 866-643-0609 and use the promo code BRAND50 to waive the $50 activation fee. You don't need the old activation fee. Visit sat123.com or you can call on your normal spy phone 866-643-0609. This service is only applicable, I'm sorry to tell you, if you're in the US, which is a shame because I currently am not and I want one of these things. Okay, let's get back to this difficult story about how we could make small changes that might make the world a little better and then communicate them so that people didn't know that's what we were planning. At the beginning of October, shares up by about 10% Lockheed Martin and then we had a few of the other key and core names. So in a way, tell me how you feel. If you feel, well, this is just the system, this is just the way things are, that's how things remain like this. This is how we find ourselves in situations of geopolitical tension that cannot be amended or resolved. War is good for business. That's what one defence executive said at a London arms conference last month. The very fact that there are arms conferences is perhaps an indication that our global ideology perhaps needs some amendment if historic conflicts are going to have any hope, any hope at all, of resolution. Well, I was at the arms conference and no one had any ideas that didn't lead to selling more arms. It was almost as if the whole thing, the whole system was geared towards selling arms. Actually, it was an arms conference. Think, No, I shouldn't have gone there. That, that was the wrong place to go for a solution. And what the stock market reflected on Monday as Israel blockaded and bombarded the Gaza Strip in response to Hamas's weekend attack that killed hundreds of Israelis. There is nothing but prayer and love that I'm able to offer in response to such a horrible piece of text and a horrible piece of information. Fox Business reported that shares of General Dynamics, which makes submarines and combat vehicles, rose the most since March 2020 when it gained over 9%. Lockheed Martin's stock jump Monday was the biggest for the US's largest defence contractor on a non-earnings day since March 2020, narrowly topping the gains it notched immediately after Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Forbes noted. Northrop Grumman shares also had their best day since 2020. If you were an investor, if you are a trader, even if you're an ordinary person who dabbles in financial matters. The fact is, is that it would be sensible, expedient, wise, frugal, fiduciary action to invest in these companies at this time. And doesn't that suggest that we've entered a moral space that is baffling, bedazzling, bewitching and bewildering? Because if there is any action that could be taken in this time that's beneficial for 
a personal and financial perspective, a war that's being fought territorially, on spiritual values, or at least religious edicts, is somewhat out of line with the direction of power and finance. Shouldn't this financial component at least somehow be ameliorated, omitted, amended? Shouldn't this at least be resolved? Because I recognise that so much of what's happening is impossible to resolve without a degree in history, a deep understanding of ethics, a willingness to think the unthinkable, open-heartedness, transcendence of personal values, tribalism, the understandable pain. I mean, this at least could be addressed. Commenting on the bloodshed in Israel and Gaza over the past few days, Samir Samana, senior global market strategist at Wells Fargo Investment Institute, told Market Watch that as countries need to replenish their weapons, we do think defence companies will do very well. So it's not all bad news. Sometimes I look at this and feel incredible despair and that there may not be a way out for us without almost inconceivable personal and global change. But over at Wells Fargo, they can see the bright side of all of this horror and death. Less than two months after Russia's invasion last year, William Hartung, a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, highlighted how such conflicts benefit the arms industry, writing that the war will indeed be a bonanza for the likes of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Last December in Forbes, Hartung warned against using the Russia-Ukraine war to permanently expand the weapons industry. Plans that have been floated so far include building new weapons factories, dramatically boosting production of ammunition, anti-tank weapons and other systems, and easing oversight of weapons procurement. Let's ease that oversight. People don't want someone peering at them when they're trying to sell weapons. These changes will come at a cost that over time will run into tens of billions of dollars above current spending plans and possibly more, much more. At a time when the Pentagon budget is soaring towards $1 trillion per year and debates about how to respond to the challenges posed by Russia and China are front and centre, it is more important than ever to make an independent assessment of the best path forward. Can we all agree on that? Ideally, this would involve objective analysis by unbiased experts and policy makers grounded in a vigorous public conversation about how best to defend the country, but more often than not, special interests override the national interests in decisions on how much to spend on the Pentagon and how those funds should be allocated. Even in this incredibly sensitive issue, you have seen bombastic rhetoric designed to make you feel honesty and transparency. And yet simultaneously, it's impossible to ignore that very powerful industries that lobby and spend a lot of money are profiting and people in Congress who are entrusted with the moral heart of a nation are plainly acting in self-interest with so much that is difficult to discuss, with so much that is uncertain, let us plainly state that that kind of corruption should be ended. One practice that introduces bias into the shaping of defence policy is the revolving door between the US government and the weapons industry. The movement of retired senior officials from the Pentagon and the military services into the arms industry is a long-standing practice that raises serious questions about the appearance and reality of conflicts of interest. Mostly because employing well-connected ex-military officers can give weapons makers enormous, unwarranted influence over the process of determining the size and shape of the Pentagon budget. A 2021 report by the Government Accountability office found that 1,700 senior government officials had taken positions in the arms industry over a five-year period, an average of well over 300 a year. And a new report from the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft found that this practice is particularly pronounced among the top generals and admirals. In the past five years, over 80% of retired four-star generals and admirals, 26 of 32, went on to work in the arms sector as board members, advisors, lobbyists, or consultants. A statistic of that nature is an indication that, to a degree, these are not separate institutions. You have people in Congress investing in stocks and shares that they are in a position to influence the trajectory of. You have a weapons industry that invests significantly in directing and biasing the policy of an entire nation. You have senior officials in very powerful positions within incredibly powerful military organizations that have financial ties to the tune of 86% of them working within the weapons industry. These again, during a very complex time, are problems that could easily be resolved and solved. The reason they're not being solved is because this is part of a system that while it is painful for so many people, even those of you that are not directly involved, it's profitable for the people that matter. And you have to ask yourself the question, no matter what they say, what is their moral position? 
And is their moral position the platform that directs their action? Or is it possible there are other intentions and other agenda? You can ask that broadly about geopolitical conflicts. I understand as much as someone as abstracted as I am that this is a situation that almost interrogating and making inquiry of is too painful for people directly involved to countenance. They simply want support for their own perspective. But what we have to look at in addition to understanding those deep, deep sensitivities that are beyond my comprehension is that if there is an institutional and profitable component to global conflicts, global conflicts are unlikely to be resolved. Let me know in the chat and the comments how you feel about that. The most recent batch of retired four-star generals they're not cookies, are not only seeking employment with the big contractors, they're also branching out to work for small and mid-sized companies that focus on cutting edge technology, like next generation drones, artificial intelligence, and cyber security. That's where international conflict and domestic conflict might conflate. Have you noticed that conditions appear to be moving in the direction of population control that has become increasingly militaristic, certainly authoritarian? Have you noticed the militarization of police forces? Are they spending money on drones? Are they gaining access to military vehicles? Are protest laws being introduced? Are new online laws that prevent communication being introduced? Watch these trends. If the past is any guide, this new influx of former military officials into the arms sector will distort Pentagon spending priorities and promote higher military budgets than would be the case absent their influence on behalf of their corporate employers. As documented, there are numerous examples of senior military officials who have advocated for dysfunctional weapons while in government and then gone on to work for the company that produce those systems. In addition, former military officers have played central roles in preventing the Pentagon from divesting itself of weapons it no longer wants or needs. The prevalence of this kind of activity is hard to track because of the limited information available about what retired military officers do once they join the arms industry. Those military officials were involved in a plan for a surprise party for your birthday and you ruined it. There's too much at stake, both in taxpayer dollars and our future security, to let conflicts of interest and special interest politics shape the Pentagon budget. The time for Congress to act to reduce the influence of the revolving door is now. Here's some information posted on X by Unusual Wales about the number of Democrats and Republicans investing in oil, energy and military industrial complex companies. He posted, here's every US politician in Congress who currently holds stock positions that will directly benefit from the war in the Middle East. And I will tell you now, it is not a very short list. It's, I mean, one would be too many but it's more than one, substantially more than one. So baffling, terrifying and awful, though this conflict is and has been for a very long while, let us focus on what we can agree on together. People in Congress should not be able to invest in companies that will benefit from military conflict. Let's end that practice. Let's have a government that's there to serve the people, certainly the domestic population, if it's possible, the population of the world, that have an intention and a trajectory towards beneficial outcomes that are not biased by or in any way guided by personal interest. Only then may we move forward in this new geopolitical climate, in this state of omni-crisis where everywhere you look there are wars in Europe that could escalate into Armageddon, potential wars in Southeast China that could escalate into the apocalypse, and in the Middle East, a region historically troubled by the intervention of imperial and colonial powers, including Britain. While these conflicts continue, there should be no opportunity for profit. It should simply be a complex, difficult, agonizing, painful matter for all those involved and those of us that are not directly involved should do everything we can to bring about a peaceful solution, even if it is in our own hearts, futile, empty and shallow as that might sound in such a painful time for so many of you. You all have my sympathy and love. That's just what I think. Let me know what you think in the comments and chat. Have a look at that if you want. Remember, 12 EST, our content premieres on Rumble. Download the app, you'll get notifications so you will know when we make content. It's vital that you support us if you can by pressing the red awaken button. It helps us. It helps our voice to remain as free as possible. It helps us to look for new ways to work together at a time of omni-crisis and global conflict. More important than that, is it more important than that? Well, if we're ever to change the world, it is. Please, if you can, stay free.